if you think that you're having a tough time in this economy, if you think that you're having a tough time in real estate, you think this market's bad, if you're having a personal tough time, you're gonna want to listen to this interview. I am interviewing Long Dawn. He is the owner, the CEO, the founder of Realty Group in Minnesota. They have about 700 agents. But his story starts in 1975 at the age of 13. He was in Vietnam and was a refugee and went through hell to get here. And it's a true American story that you're going to want to hear. First, like, subscribe. And if you want to check more of our videos, more of our um, podcast and uh, more information about real estate, go to realtyhack.com. We're about to launch Realty Hack Academy that has a ton of useful information for agents that want to level up their game. All right, I'm here with Long Dawn, and he is uh, the owner, um, you're not the broker there, are you? Yep, I, I'm the founder, owner, and broker. Okay, good. Okay, I wasn't sure if you had another designated broker, but um, of R RG Realty Group, right? Yep, Realty Group with RG for short. Yeah, cool. Well, you know, I've known you for a while, and um, really got to know you at the last Ball, uh, Ball Up Boss uh, Summit when, you know, uh, you heard you speak and went to, what did we go to lunch or dinner with Anthony Machia and Gary? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was dinner. Him. Yeah, dinner. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I got to hear your story, and um, we've been putting this off for a while, uh, but I wanted to hear, you know, talk about that. Well, first of all, tell the listeners, RG, you have a very successful business, um, hundreds of agents, but uh, you want to let's start with that makeup of your company first, and then we'll go back to your story. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So uh, this is my 33rd year in the business. My first 15 years, I was on the mortgage side. My last 18 in real estate. I started Realty Group in 2009. And I'm sure you remember, Ryan, the crazy time, 08, 09, 2010, right? So yeah. uh, I did a lot of foreclosures. Right off the bat, I think I closed like a thousand transactions my first three years in the industry. Well, um, uh, I did. I thought I was normal, but apparently that's pretty good. <laughs> and then uh, it wasn't until 2014, my business partner now, Mike and I became partners and we had eight agents at the time. So we decided to grow the brokerage together. And today we have over 700. We're the number one independently owned in Minnesota. Um, I think there's like 142,000 brokerages in America. Realtrend published the top 150 were at number 148 overall in America. Wow, that's outstanding. Um, and, and are all those, those, uh, agents you have just in Minnesota or your other states as well? So mostly Minnesota, but in Minnesota, where the twin cities were like half an hour from Wisconsin. So of those, about a hundred of them are also dual licensed in Minnesota and Wisconsin. So I didn't want to duplicate and count them twice, but we have 700 yeah. there and then we just started to grow Florida. So we, we, we got a little over a dozen down there right now, which just started this year, so, but city? mostly Minnesota. So we're in, in Florida, it's one of those crazy things that every 20 miles radius, there's a different MOS. So right yeah. now we're in the Tampa market, Fort Myers, Cape Coral. We're down Naples. We're in Miami and Fort Lauderdale and Orlando. Wow. Outstanding. Okay. Well, let's talk about your story because it's a very uh, heartfelt story. And, and, you know, it's a true American success story, in my opinion. Um, so you want to get through, through that? Yeah, uh, so I'm originally from Vietnam. Uh, I came to America when I was 13 years old by myself. So in Vietnam, a communist country, when the American left in uh, 1975 there, you know, the communists came in to the south. That's where my family lived in Saigon, which is now called uh, Ho Chi Minh City, okay? When the communist country, they have these things called re-education camps. So re-education camps is, is when they would arrest anyone who was a threat to their ide ideology, right? So people wait, can wait, think can I, for themselves. Can, can I ask you, so you left at 13, but what was it? You were there dur during the war then. Yep. So I was eight years old when this happened, 1975. Okay. I was eight. My brothers were four and two. I have two younger do, brothers. Do you remember what it was like during the war? A little because you were eight years old, right? You remember bits yeah. and pieces. You know, we remember looking out the door, seeing, you know, soldiers running around with guns and stuff. And then all of a sudden, quiet. And then a bunch of other people move in. That kind of thing, but nothing too crazy because the war was happening outside the city until the very last minute when the American left. 
Okay, so you're in Saigon, which is one of the bigger cities there, right? Correct. Yep. So it's uh, it was the capital back then. Now Ho Chi Minh City uh, is the name of the city there. So, okay. uh, yep. So 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 when do you remember? So when 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 uh, you know the American troops would withdrew, right? And then um, and then what happened? So then the communists came in, and for the next several months, uh, they were arresting people who can think for themselves into a re-education camp because if you uh, can think, you're a threat. So doctors, attorneys, uh, professors, people who are educated, musicians, poets, whatever. Well, my dad was a professor. So Ryan and I was eight. My brothers were four and two. I remember, uh, you know, that part I remember very vividly for only eight years old. It was pretty dark outside in the morning. All of a sudden we have a, you know, a bunch of loud knocks coming in and a bunch of strangers came to our house rummaged through everything for the next several hours, put my dad in hands cuff, and, um, you know, and eventually they took him away. I remember sitting in his lap the whole time, just being scared. He said, don't worry about it. You know, nothing, it's, it's okay. When he left, he said, I didn't do anything wrong. Don't worry, I'll see you soon. I was eight. My brothers were four and two. Well, he was arrested into re-education camp, and I didn't see him again until I was 32 years old. So what, what do they do in re-education camp? Yeah, well, they put you in there, and unless you said, yep, I believe in communism, and, you know, I don't believe in democracy and human rights or whatever, then you get to go home. And then, you know, but my dad never uh, uh, graduated, I guess. He he wasn't a very good learner on that. So uh, he actually wrote books and got smuggled out uh, regarding democracy and human rights. So that's why he was actually in prison way longer than he should have. So yeah, I was again. I was eight. I didn't see him again, and I was thirty-two years old. So that that day was a, but pretty crazy. So what happened to you? What, like who took care of you? Was was your was your mom around? But then after that, uh, my pa- my grandparents lived with us because that's kind of the culture. My dad was the oldest uh, there, so they lived with us. So after that, my mom works two jobs. She's a teacher, so she teaches two jobs to support our family. I have two younger bro- younger brothers. So she's supporting three kids and two parents and herself, okay? My job during that time, it was called um, the rationed period. So it doesn't matter how much money you have. You cannot just buy anything you want. You only get rationed a certain amount. So while my mom was working two jobs, my jobs, I was the man of the house at eight years old, right? So my job every day after school would go line up in long line in the hot and humid. I don't know where everybody is today. Uh, Minnesota is pretty hot and humid lately. You know, you're in some other part of the world. It's pretty bad, right? So it would be two, three hours every day, long lines, just to get a ration of stuff. So we would buy rice on Monday. That's all they would give you is the head count of six people, the, 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 the ration they believe that you would need for a week, okay? Yeah. Tuesday might be detergent. Wednesday might be some vegetable. You know, Thursday might be some spices. I mean, that was how it was. You know, you, you couldn't even buy stuff if you had money. You had to go line up and get it through the government. So that was my job until I was 13 years old. And during this time, a lot of people left Vietnam for a better life, of course, because life is pretty rough. And because we're a coastal country, about 90% of the people, almost 2 million people left Vietnam by way of boats. That's why we were called the boat people. So I was one of those boat people. And... It was very expensive to get one of the spot on the boat. So, you know, and, and risky. So my mom didn't want to send all, all of us on, right? And someone has, so by the way, prison back then in Vietnam is also not like how it is here. I mean, they give you just enough food, a little bit of rice and water to survive, but your family member actually feed you. So every month or so, my mom would bring food to him, you know, salted food that would last longer, dry food, that kind of stuff. And we did that years until I, I left, but I got to tag along with her when I was still there. Wow. So you got to see your dad once a month in prison. Sometimes we'll show up and he's being disciplined, you know, maybe, you know, but not, maybe not ever doing whatever they told him he's supposed to do. So we wouldn't get to see him, just drop off the food. So, mm-hmm. so there's a few times we only saw him twice a year. Wow. So, okay. So your, your mom saves up money to send, was it, uh, who, who is this you and your, your two brothers, your brother or sister? Nope. Just me by myself, 13 years old. 
because wow. my two younger brother were too young and it cost a lot of money. So she couldn't afford to get us all at the same time. And it's also risky because the survival rate's only 50%. So if wow. they send all three kids, we could all die and we'd all live, right? Yeah. And what kind of boat was it? Yep. So what happened, this was my third try because, you know, it, it's it's a 50% chance of survival. So the first time we were all going to try, my mom got took all of her savings that she had and got herself, me, and my two brothers, you know, uh, on tickets, I guess you would call it, because it's, it's human smuggling, right? <laughs> yeah. So so we were waiting around to be picked up, and she got scared because she said, if because she leave, no one's going to take care of my dad. They, he didn't know we were leaving, right? Yeah. She didn't want to take a risk and, and, and all of her life in one shot. We could all die. You know, so she kind of chickened out, back out, lost all of her money because we already paid. So right before we got picked up to go, she's like, nope, we can't do this. So we didn't. That's right. I was 12 years old. So my younger brother was a mechanic. So she was able to make a deal for him because they need a mechanic for this trip that if he goes on the boat, he gets to take one person with him. That was me. So this is back in the early 80s when Vietnam was at war with the Chinese. And if you leave and you get caught and you're a 16-year-old or a male, you're death sentence. But instead of killing you, they just send you to the front line of the war and run around to someone shoot you. They didn't want to waste a bullet on you, right? Wow. So, so we're ready. I had talked about it, that if we get caught, my uncle would bail and I would just roll with it, you know, because yeah. I was only 12. So what happened back then is this river fishing boats. River fishing boats, not ocean fishing boats. Yeah. People would build little secret compartment underneath. And we would go high underneath and we fish down the Mekong River. So the Mekong River is a major river that runs across uh, Southeast uh, uh, Asian countries. And eventually it feeds into the ocean. Okay. So in Vietnam, we would get on this boat because I live in Saigon. So we would fish down the Mekong River until we get out into national water. And, and then that's when you see. Hundreds of people come on the top, right? Because now we're international water. So yeah. on that trip, what happened is, as you fish down the Mekong River, you're going to go through checkpoints, like Coast Guard checkpoints. So every time you go through, you would bribe them to let you through because they could tell there's something going on because the boat's like sinking, right? I mean, it seemed yeah. really heavy. So that that time, we paid them, bribed them. They still took our money and turned us in. So we got caught, okay? Now, I remember that trip. My uncle did, middle of the night, jump off the ship and swim off. So he luckily escaped. So I got caught. And for the next two days, man, it was, it, was, it was like August or something like that. It was hot and humid outside. I was 12 years old, obviously very scared. I mean, they were scaring us with a lot of threat. But one of the ones they were doing was they were just teasing us for the next two days. We sat outside with no water, no food. They literally was like, Oh, yeah, the Americans coming to pick you up. They'll be here shortly. They're on their way. You know, just like teasing us and, you know, just just feel bad, you know. Yeah. But because I was only 12, after two days, they did let me go home. Okay. Whereas I saw they took all the other older men away to wherever, obviously. How did you get home? And I just figured out a way to get home. You know, I got on, get a ride from somebody, get whatever, and walk yeah. a ton until I got home. But you're by yourself at 12 years old. Yep. Wow. Yep. So the third time, I knew we're still going to leave because there's no future for me there. And my family, you know, has no future. But that's why a lot of people left Vietnam. So my third time, I knew I was going to leave, just didn't know when. Because you're 13, right? If, if mom tell me, I'm going to tell my friends, my brothers, or whatever, and it's going to get out. And, 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 and it, you know, people are going to find out about it, then it wouldn't happen. So I remember the third try. It was a weeknight. And I remember both my brothers got to go to my cousin for a sleepover. And that doesn't happen like on a school night, right? I, I was only 13. I'm, I'm not smart enough at the time to be aware of what's going on. Um, and then my grandma made me my, my field that night, um, you know, barbecue pork, which I didn't have to fight my brothers for it because we were getting like maybe an ounce of meat that we split as a family back then, right? Wow. So, I know, man. When you go out now, I order an 8, 12, 16 ounce steak. I mean, it's, back then, you know, one ounce, we'd be scared for the whole family, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm like eating my barbecue pork, just enjoying it. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. 
Then before we went to bed, both my grandma and my mom, because my dad and my grandpa did not know about these trip. They would say no, right? Because it's risky. So they both, you know, told me they love me. I went to bed early. I should have gone, all right, what's going on here? Something's not right. But I wasn't even thinking. I'm just enjoying, you know, sure. all the stuff, all the attention. And then it was about three o'clock in the morning. My mom and my grandma came, woke me up and I knew it was goal time. I said, okay, you're leaving. I'm like, all right, you know. So my grandma gave me a hug. I still get emotional when I talk about it. Say goodbye to me. I didn't realize at the time. That was the last time I ever saw her. Cause she died mm-hmm. a few years later from being older, right? Yeah. And then my mom on bicycle, you might see a picture of these in Asia, like bike, everyone bikes around, right? So bicycle, pedaling. I'm standing in the back, the two packs sticking out. <laughs> I'm yeah. standing in the back. She bites, rolled me about an hour out of the city where I met up with a man that I've never met before, a stranger that she knew, already all set up. And then, you know, she said goodbye to me, gave me a hug and walked away really fast. Again, remember, I was only 13. This is my third try. I'm thinking... No problem, mom. See you later. I'll see you probably in a couple of days like I did last time, right? I mean, without realizing that's the last time I would see my mom for a very, very long time. And yeah. then I'm thinking, she also didn't make it a big deal. She's like, I'm proud of you. You know, you can do this. Bye. And she walked away right away. Well, later on, of course, she told me she had to do that because she didn't want to see her cry. Yeah. Right? Sure, she's holding back her emotions. She didn't want to scare you, right? Yeah. I mean, she may never see me again alive, right? Yeah. There's a 50% yeah. chance. It's a, it's a flip of a coin right now at this point. So sure. so the, the strange man has a moped. It's motorized. So he drove me another hour out of the city. Now I'm in the area of like outside the city, like rice paddy, like places you would see on TV on a Vietnam War movie, right? Those type. Yeah. Yeah. I met up with a group. I was the last one to arrive. And there was a group of eight. And of course, I was, one, I was the youngest one. And there's already seven other people. And it's about, about now, it's about five o'clock, still dark outside. And I remember we started to walk toward the river. So we walked through like rice paddy. I was 13 at the time, but I was very small for my size, not like normal 13 year old here. So I remember it's like the mud was like up to my chest. I don't know anybody. I'm trying to keep up with them. They're like way ahead of me. You know, I fight through it, got about 20 minutes or so, got on a little boat, which we would call a dinghy here. So a little yeah. boat that took eight of us to, the big boat. So I got on the big boat. I think we're also the last group to arrive. And I remember walking down to, to the bottom like I did before. And this time, this one was bigger. Last time was like 80 some people. I found out later I was one of 153 people. Wow. And this is one of those river boats as well? Yep. River boat. Yeah. That's not an ocean boat. Not yeah. made for ocean. So I'm sitting in my office right now. I got a background on just like you two. Well, you can't tell. But most of the office is like 10 by 10, right? Think of about two offices, maybe three at most, 153 people sitting there. Wow. You know, it's like shoulder to shoulder, sitting down, right? So dark out, we started doing it. So I kind of know the drill because the last time, every time we went through uh, a checkpoint, we would hear from the top, knock, knock, knock. That means everyone be quiet, okay? We even had conversation radio. If you have little kids, because some people... Came as a family, they don't make a noise because you muzzle them. You have to kill them. You will too because if they catch us, all the men on the boats are pretty much dead, right? So yeah. it was just very scary every time you get those knock knock on the top. Well, yeah. luckily this time we got through all the checkpoints. Okay. However, it took a while because you're supposed to be leisurely fishing, right? You're not like rushing down the river, right? Right. Well, we by the time we got out to international water, during this time, we all sat next to each other. Go number one, number two, get a little water just to not buy dehydration. For yeah. me, it felt like a lifetime, Ryan. So sure. we got out to this time. We actually got out to international water. This is farther than I did last time. So how how long did it take you from getting into the bigger boat to the international waters? Yep. So as soon as we got international water, we all said we made it to international water. Everyone gets to go on top. So I've always been taught to be polite. I help all these people to go up top, right? I was one of the last to come up. And I remember when I got up to the top, a fresh air, I thought I went from hell to heaven, man. But, but was, it, was that like one day it took till you get to international? Because that's when I found out because I didn't know how long, right? Yeah. That's when I found out it has been three days. Wow. Now, 
Imagine three days. If you ever been to one of those satellite outside at a sporting event, concert, you know, uh, camping, and yeah. it hasn't been clean in weeks, and you're stuck inside, dark, no air for three days. Yeah. Wow. That's what it was like, right? So at this point, just like fresh air. I mean, this is amazing. I got all excited, and I look around, and I noticed everyone is just somber. They actually look more scared than before. Then I re- realized, because I've been told the story, if you made it to this point, it's a point of no return. Yeah. Because now you you're not back. getting caught anymore to go home. Now you're here, you're either going to die or you're going to make it. Because yeah. the escape plan is, when you get out to international water, you'll just float until someone sees you. If they see you, right? That's right. And if they do, there's two types of boat that will see you. One is during the early 80s. As you remember, the economy was really bad, right? Um, the, the, around the world, okay? Mm-hmm. And all the fishermen in surrounding country, Thai, Malaysia, you know, Japan, China, they all turned pirates, okay? Because they know these boat people, when we leave, we can't take the money with us because it's not even worth the, the papers printed on. So mm-hmm. people convert jewelries, all the money to jewelries, they take them with. So they would find these boats, you cannot outmaneuver like ocean boat, right? They come on board, take all the jewelry, rape the women, and kill everybody and sink the boat. Because wow. that was mostly killing. Because all the gas, all the food, they'll take everything. You're just going to float until you die. That's even worse, right? So they'll just yeah. sink the boat. So yeah. that's what that's what would happen. And, and if all know that, so we're like, shit, it's good and it's bad, right? Yeah. Good news, bad news. Yeah. So, for us, this is now three days. So uh, we floated. We got lucky. We never ran into any uh, pirates. But at 13 years old, I did see floating bodies. So some other boat must have been sunken nearby at some point recently. So, yeah. so you know, that's pretty scary to see, you know. You said there was two types of boats, though, right? One was the, one, yep, one the was second fishing. one was a good boat. These are uh, shipping vessel that yeah. would go through shipping lane, right? Like the big, huge ones with the containers? Yeah. You got okay. it. They yep. they will spot you, and they will call to the nearest refugee camp. So Red Cross has set up refugee camp in uh, surrounding country to Vietnam. Thai, Malaysia, Indonesia, right? So the 11th day, one day left of food and water. We will be out. We already know that, right? We're down because, remember, we have 153 people. So yeah. one day left of food and water, we all kind of know that we've been rationed very little already the whole last several days. A big French shipping vessel spotted us coming from far away because we're trying to make noise. They can't see us, right? Well, luckily, they spotted us. They called into the nearest refugee camp. For us, where we were was in Malaysia. So they came out, the refugee camp, sent a boat out and tuck us in, like pull us in. So this is the eleventh day. So let me ask you this: these, so at that time, these uh, shipping container boats, they they were always on the lookout for uh, refugees, and that was just kind of like a, a like a public service then that they would do, right? Yep. And you you see it based on the timing, right? And it's a large well, God, ocean. Yeah. Well, God bless them, though, right? Absolutely. So they knew that that was what's happening. They would look out for us, and they see somebody, they'll pull up. Make sure we're not pirates or anything, you know, and then yeah. and then call in. Wait, let me ask you this. So, so the, the the plan is they go when you're in a fishing boat, you go out to ocean, and 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 their plan is just to look for just go until you see a shipping container boat. That's the whole plan. Well, until you hope a good guy see you. Wow, that's crazy. Many people ran out of food, water, or rough sea condition that tipped the boat. Flip the boat, yeah. people die. That's why 50% chance of people making it. Half the people did not make it. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. So, so okay. They, so th- does, do they pull you into to the shipping container boat? Oh, no, no, no. They let us like get close to them and they throw rope and tie us up mm-hmm. while we waited, right? And during this time, man, of course, they, they gave us some fruit and some water, you know, because we haven't eaten in a while while we're waiting. Dude, I remember seeing this big red apple, so juicy. I could not believe it. I'm like, like the kid hasn't eaten in months, you know? It was pretty amazing. How do you get from the fishing, I mean, from the fishing boat to the shipping container? You don't even get on the shipping container then. Oh, no, no. They don't let us on. They don't know. We might have disease, yeah. we might have whatever. And liability sure. and whatever it is, they know. We, we never bought their boat. 
So the refugee camps come to you at that point? Yep. So they send a boat out. And then okay. it's a little boat, so they, they grab us and they pull us in, right? Because by now, we're pretty much no gas left out. I don't think we even made it to the camp if we knew where it was. You know? Yeah, so, right. So, so they're in, and then we all get onboarded or checked in. You know, we got the shot or whatever, because they want to make sure, you know, disease and stuff. And the camp I was at, Ryan, in Wikipedia page, is nicknamed Hell Island. Considered to be the most heavily populated place on Earth at the time. I was one of 4,000 people in the size of a football field. Wow. Living on, on mud and dirt and on, on an island with no structures pretty much, right? Uh-huh. So so I, we got all checked in, and then it's the first night. This is 11, 11 days now, 11 days a night. We got to send a telegram. Some of the listeners don't even know what the telegram is, right? You and I at least right. old enough to might know at yeah. least what the telegram is. So yeah. I was able to send a telegram to my mom to let her know. That I made it. Now, I know you, man. Me too. I got kids. When my kids were younger, they went next door for a sleepover. And I'm calling and touching them just to make sure they're okay. Yeah. Can you imagine your kid being gone, your firstborn for 11 days. You don't even know if he live or die. Yeah. Right? So I was able to do that. And then the first night, of course, I don't know anybody. I'm by myself. I'm 13. So mm-hmm. I remember the first night. It was very crowded. And I'm not even sure where I'm supposed to go. I just found a spot on the beach that night and everyone was starting to settle down or whatever. And I just found a spot where it wasn't a lot of people. I remember I, I started crying. I mean, it's the first time I mostly cried as a 13 year old. Were you crying because you made it or because you're just by yourself and alone or all of it? Yeah, all of it. Oh. Because it finally hit me. Of course, I, I've been beat up, got in a fight, fell. I've cried before, but never like emotionally cry, right? Because yeah. it finally hit me, Ryan as I look across that ocean, that I made it. And then I realized, wait a minute. I cry because I'm like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because it just hit me that everybody I knew are on the other side of the ocean, and I'll probably never see them again, yeah. which was actually true. I'll tell you the, the happy ending later. I ended up reuniting with my two younger brother, my mom, my dad. Okay, They're all in, in America right now. However, yeah. at that point, I didn't know. Besides them, I've never seen anyone else. My aunt, uncle, cousin, both grandma and grandpa died. Of course, it's been 40-some years. I have not been back. I have not seen anyone. So wow. that night, all the emotion rushed to me, right? I'm like, yeah. wait a minute. Am I lucky that I made it because half the people die and I'm here right now? Or am I unlucky that I made it and I'll probably never see all those people again? And I already know my job that if I made it, I got to go figure out how to take care of myself and then take care of my family back in Vietnam. That's a lot of yeah. pressure for someone who's 13 years old, sure, right? Sure. So so when you're there, for well, how long did you end up staying at that camp? So let me tell you about that night. So I ended up crying all night, just struggling back and forth. I remember the, the, the sun came up. People started to wake up. I remember thinking to myself, all right, I, I got to decide right now to what to do, right? And I did not realize this until much later because you and I and a lot of people we hang around with understand the mindset thing and all this other thing, right? I did not realize at that time how important our mindset is. Yeah. I remember struggling with, am I a victim or a victor? Am I a victim here? Am I lucky or unlucky? I remember telling myself at that point, well, as the sun was coming up, and I'm like, I am lucky. Put your big boy pants on and go figure shit out and then take care of everybody else. I could have gone through that night thinking, I'm a victim. I'm 13 years old, refugee boy. What am I supposed to do, right? Feel sorry for myself. Just just survive, you know? But I, But I didn't. And that moment, I look back now, is what I call my why moment. So it's that moment that determines who I am today. This is why anytime you are know, anytime someone I know asks me for help or do anything, I want to help them because I never want to feel the way I felt that night. I don't yeah. want them to feel that way. Helpless, hopeless, just lost, you know? Yeah. So anytime people reach out to me, I will do it because I don't want them to feel the way I felt. And that's my why why really hard now, why I'll help anybody who needs my help. So that first night was was historic for me when I look back in my life, okay? mm-hmm. which lead to the next day. So I finally figure out where I'm supposed to go. As an orphan, I got to go stay with the family, you know, like uh, there's some cover for us. And I was uh, one of four boys and there's three other girls, there's seven of us. And there's an adult that check in on us every so often. Okay, And the first night, 
which is the second night that I got to sleep. The second night, which I went to sleep, which is my first night of sleeping, I woke up to rats the size of my dog now. This wow. size running around. And remember, there's 40,000 people on the size of a football field just living uh, on the ground, you know? So yeah. very dirty condition, you know, people get sick, the whole stuff. So during the, this is camp, right? So uh, when you declare what country you go to, if you get accepted, then you go to school to learn that language and the culture. Well, my uncle who lived in Minnesota, that's my dad's brother. We already kind of pre-planned this. I, I applied to go to America and I list my uncle as my sponsor. Well, because I'm an orphan and I had a sponsor, I was only there for about Wait, nine so months. You were, at the camp for, you were at the camp for nine months? Which is very short. Most people were there for four to five years. Wow. You were going camping for four to five years in, yeah. in a really crowded concert type of atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. Except there's no good music, right? And no, yeah, it's not, a, yeah. Yeah, because you don't have a sponsor. You have to wait for a nonprofit or church to sponsor you. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So people yeah. are there four to five years. So anyways, that was camp life. Twice a day, we go to school to learn whatever. The rest time on our own. And we get meal twice a day because we can't cook for ourselves because we might burn the place down. So we're kids, so there's no breakfast, really. So we get lunch and dinner. We go line up and get our food. That was camp life for me for about nine months. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, during this time, as a few uh, big, big, huge monsoon season. Okay. Mm -hmm. And people who've been there for several years tell us monsoon season, we always lose a few people. What happened was the rain was so hard, washed people out to the sea. Wow. I remember uh, the headcount for during my time was there was like about two dozen people who just disappeared during monsoon season. Can you imagine, made it all the way there and then die in the ocean, dragged back out from the, from the because of the monsoon. Yeah. Pretty crazy, right? Yeah. So, that was life for, for, for several months uh, for me. And here's the crazy thing. Every morning, the camp in the come system would come on, Ryan. And this is where they announce, not every day, but most day, they announce the name of the people who gets to leave that day. This is like lottery announcement. Yeah. You know? All of a sudden, now the, 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 the noise come on. We all like stay quiet. Everyone who's sleeping, you got woken up. Let's, let, let's hope it's your name. So hope your name, right? But you just yeah. don't know. Well, a group of guys I hang out with, four boys, three girls, we kind of like a gang head together because we kind of back each other up, not get picked on, right? You're stronger when you're when you there's, there's more of you, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Power number. I learned a lot of communication skill, negotiation skill, and leadership skill during my, my life there. I didn't realize some of those sure. skills I learned back there, right? Just to survive, you know? So, uh, so anyways... One of my best friends, this is pretty scary. Um, he's been there already three, almost four years. And he was the same age as me. And I remember thinking, because he came by himself too. I remember him thinking, man, I'm probably going to get married here and have kids here. Can you imagine when you're 13, 14 years old and you're having those kind of conversations? Yeah. You got to, like, all kids now, like, want to play video game, you know, go play ball, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So, yeah. so my neck call. That one morning, mm -hmm. I was standing next to the one couple who's like checking on us all the time, like oversee them. They didn't have to, but they're like volunteer. You know, I, I see a bunch of little kids here. I'll, I'll keep an eye on you guys, right? Kind of like our guardian, so to speak. I remember also the first time I learned how guilt make you feel. Like you realize how lucky you are, right? Yeah. I still get emotional about this. When I get remember my name got called. I asked him, I said, can I give my spot to my friend who's been there three years? I remember him lightly kind of slapping across the face like, wake up, man. No, you're, you're taking your spot. You're getting out of here. Yeah. And you have like minutes. When your name's called, they're like, get to down to the dock. The ship is going to go to Kuala Lumpur. And then that's where you go through your whole process to get out, right? So yeah. I remember I was trying to run, find my friend, let him know. They gave me a little bag, a little best bag. Uh, uh, with a pair of jeans and a shirt that would fit me. I still saved it. I got my pair of shorts and the shirt I came to America with and a pair of jeans and the shirt they gave me with the bag. I was eight year, I was in eighth grade when I left, but just about every year my kids in eighth grade, I come to their school and tell that story as an eighth grader. And I still share that bag of what's in my bag I came to America with. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. So then uh, I got to, 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 of course, that's how I ended up in Minnesota. 
My uncle who sponsored me. How did you get there? How, did they, do you take a flight or? Kuala Lumpur. They do all the paperwork. I got on a plane. I fly, you know, a couple of flights, layover, whatever. And I got to uh, to uh, Minneapolis and my uncle picked me up. Right? Wow. So, uh, so my uncle left in 1975, right when the time when you see plainly people hanging on in history books, right? He was one yeah. of those, except it was a boat, a couple of boats leaving. I'm, he, I'm telling me a story. He'd jump in, swim out to the boat. They got into one of those big boats that was leaving. So he left in 1975, headed up in Minnesota, and he was the one who sponsored me. So <laughs> he was still going to school at the University of Minnesota, married with two kids, my cousin. So I ended up coming to live with them, a two-bedroom. So I live with my two cousins in one bedroom. They live in one. Two years later, my younger brother luckily made the trip and also made it. He ended up in Indonesia instead of Malaysia. Uh-huh. And uh, his story in Indonesia was snakes. There's snakes everywhere, but no rats. Of course, they eat all the rats, right? So they yeah. got no rat, but they got a lot of snakes. So because he's an orphan as well, he's only there for about a year. So he came to America. I ended up uh, moving out. Raise him from eighth grade to high school while I, I worked three jobs and go to University of Minnesota. So, so, wait a second. So, you were living on your own at like what, 14 or 15? At the refugee camp. Yep. Until I came to live with my aunt and uncle. Got you. But, but when you, but when did you move in on, on your own out, outside of your aunt and uncle? Yeah, when my, my brother came over. So, at this time, I already graduated high school. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. I, yep. Uh, we got an apartment. I raised him from eighth grade to high school. I went so, uh, to University of Minnesota and I worked three jobs. So, okay, but what, did you did you did you speak any English when you got here? Nope. <laughs> wow. Okay. And how was it? Uh, they teach you at the camp the language. So English, as you know, right? Just like you go to learn Spanish or whatever. It's pen, pencil, hello, bathroom. Yeah, you don't know. Yeah, you don't know anything until you actually start doing it, right? Yeah. So, so when you got when you landed in America. Were, were you, how, what was that like? How was it for you? Was it just like, like, were you happy that you, you finally made it there? Just imagine the scenery change in a couple of days, right? <laughs> I'm yeah. going through, you know, the refugee camp to whichever even that great. It's a student housing, two bedroom, yeah. student housing, but it's still amazing to me, you know? So of course you and I uh, have done well. I'm sure our house is nicer than most now, but back yeah. then, man, you know, it's still pretty amazing to me, all the food, all the stuff. And so- so you get you get your own apartment at eighteen. What were you you doing? You were going you were, you were going to college. What did you go to college for? So my first year, I went to school for electrical engineer because you know I'm Asian. I'm good at math and science. <laughs> but uh, within a year, I realized I I didn't enjoy it. I'm more of a people person. So I switched to business and communication. And then I worked three jobs just to be able to support myself and and my brother uh, while going to school. And then and then did when did your your youngest brother uh, come? Yep. And what happened was. During this time, uh, people started to find out who I am. So my dad started to become, uh, I don't know, I want to say infamous or famous, whatever word you want to use. So yeah. he's like, he's the Nelson Mandela of Vietnam now. Wow. So his, his, his being published in the, uh, around the world. And uh, John McCain actually adopted him as a prisoner of conscience. Because as you know, John McCain is a PMW himself in Vietnam. So that's the only reason they didn't kill off my dad. So every year during that time, it was a economic embargo on Vietnam by the U.S. So every time the U.S. have a conversation with the Vietnamese government about whatever, my dad's name would come on a short list of how he's doing. That's the only yeah. reason they didn't kill him off, right? So because people found out that was me, the firstborn son, they ended up, I became the poster child for what's called uh, prisoner of conscience. So mm-hmm. I would travel around the country to accept uh, awards on my dad's behalf, uh, the John F. Kennedy Human Rights Award. I was, I met John, the John F. Kennedy family, accepted an award, gave a speech, you know, uh, Ted Turner, uh, you know, all this journalists uh, award. I had to write speeches. I mean, I was like from the age of 16 to about 20. I was traveling two, three times a year. I spoke with congressmen, senator about my dad, just any way to try to get him out. Anyways, yeah. during the same time, I also sponsored my mom and my youngest brother. So Back then, I know there's a lot of controversial how things work right now with the border, right? Yeah. Back then, there's a process that I had to go through as a as a. So yeah. I, I I had to at a refugee camp for eight nine months months. I they came to America because my uncle sponsored me. Uh, I went to work. I got a job. I had to prove and become a U.S. citizen, which I did. It took me like five years, six mm-hmm. years, and then I have to prove that I'm I have a good enough job to be able to support. 
my mom and my youngest brother when they come over. So it took me several years to sponsor them, but they got to come over by way of sponsorship. So mm-hmm. by then, the, the American and the Vietnamese have worked out this program, okay? So uh, it's called the Orderly Departure Program, ODP. But, but anyways, I saved money, bought the flight for my mom and my youngest brother to come to America to, to live with us. And then when she came over, she took over and campaigned for my dad, who eventually uh, got released when I was 32 years old. And he finally got to come to America. That was back in the early 1990s. Wow. Okay. That is one hell of a story. And so, you know, when 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 you when you got into, you, you said you were in the mortgage industry for a number of years, right? F- 15 years. And did you, uh, I mean, do you think that that gave you like the biggest work ethic ever or what? Based on my background already, I, I was not afraid of work, right? I just want yeah. an opportunity because remember in Vietnam, there's no opportunity, period. Something yeah. Americans don't realize is the land of opportunity is real. If you work yeah. hard enough, you know, you can take advantage of the opportunity. It's just up to you. So that's why you see a lot of immigrants are very successful because we have, we're not afraid of hard work. Always. We see our will take advantage of them. So, uh, so yeah, so mortgage, which is kind of weird, right? Mortgage and real estate. Because in our culture, you grow up, you become a doctor, an attorney, a pharmacist or whatever, right? Or an engineer. Yeah. So when I try to tell my parents that's what I do, I'm like, what is that? What's mortgage and what's real estate? Because unlike America, most country, you can't just go get a loan and buy a house. The house we live in been passing down for three to four generations. Yeah. There's no such thing as what we have here, you know? So yeah. the, the, just, the, just the mortgages and lending work and real yeah. estate, buy, sell every four or five years is just crazy. Yeah, right. And so, so – I think that, that when you look back and you, and you look back at all the, the things you went through, do you feel like like this extreme sense of confidence? Like when stuff gets bad, you're like, huh, not really. <laughs> you're totally right. So think of all of us in the real estate industry, right? Um, yeah. A closing got delayed. Something happened. Everyone's like, oh, panic. I'm like, hey, man, that's like not the worst thing I've been through. You know what I'm saying? Not- so you're right. Because of that, I'm able to stay calm and keep my clients calm. If you're yeah. panicking, they're panicking too, right? So yeah, yeah. I'm also very confident on, on, on not fail. That's another thing for me because I failed so many times. I came from nothing. I'm like, yeah. I got nothing to lose. If I got everything, I already know how to start it. I have no problem starting again. So, you know, that that really helped me with businesses because, as you know, hard to, to run, run a business, right? Very challenging. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this, I mean, I, we don't have time here. I can tell you dozens and dozens of me failing at things. You know? Sure. So, so it, did you say you've never been back? Yep, because we're on what's called the blacklist. We cannot get what's called re-entry visa. So the Vietnamese government, because of who my dad is, so here's how his story is. He finally got released after years of working on it. The last four years, of, by the way, in his prison term, he was in isolation. They don't want him to know what's going on in the war anymore to be able to write article, right? Yeah. Which was getting smuggled out and published. So they finally let him go with one condition. Because if he, he gets in Vietnam, there might be a revolution. Because he already became that person, right? From Nelson, Nelson Mandela of Vietnam. So the only condition is have to be exiled immediately. So, so he's, oh, I'm not leaving. Because he's been isolated for a year. He doesn't know what's going on. So, yes. so the, the Red Cross got to go back and visit him once a year, Ryan, just to check on him. So mm-hmm. the time they got to come back, they're like, my mom, you got to come back with us and convince him. We work hard to get him out. My mom came back, told him, but right now, kidney condition really bad. He's almost legally blind. He hasn't upgraded his glasses in like 20-some years, right? Really yeah. thin. I mean, just, just not just not health condition. So my younger brother, the one I raised, was going to get married. In a couple, in, in the, my mom said, you get to get out. You come over. Attend your son's wedding. And by the way, there's this thing called internet. This is just happening. So yeah. this thing called email. You can work from outside the country and send email back and communicate. You're not running away from the country. You're not abandoning okay, so, them. So he, he he could have left and he didn't. That's right. Wow. Wow. What a guy. Okay. And so so because of that, you guys are blacklisted. You can't you still you can't still go back. We think in another year or two, maybe, because it's because the older leadership team have eventually started to die off, right? They're really yeah. old now. They're in their seventies and eighties. These are the Vietnam War people who fought so hard for what they have. They don't want to give up control of the power, you know? Yeah. So Wow. Well, Long, that is a amazing story, and I really, really appreciate you taking the time to tell it. Uh, where can people find you? Yeah, I mean, you can Google me, Long Doan in Minnesota. You know, I'm on Facebook. 
Uh, yeah, my car, my name spelling on here, but I mean, I like to end with this, man. First of all, I appreciate you uh, having me on and sharing my story because what I want to tell people is it doesn't matter where you come from or where you are today. It's where you go tomorrow. And you get to decide that. You know, mm-hmm. the, what I learned at a very young age is that life is nothing but a choice theory. We have three choices on, on, on everything we do. Okay, One is, in any situation, you choose to do nothing, which is fine, right? For some people, that's okay. But most of the time, if things not working out, choose to do nothing is the definiteness enough insanity, right? Do the same thing over and over again, expect a different result. Yep. So, But you can choose to do anything. That's one choice. The second choice is to change how you think. If you think you can't, you're right. If you think you can, you're right. Okay. And then the third thing is you can do is choose what you do. If you change what you're doing, you could change your situation, right? So I want to encourage people right now. It's hard out there. Real estate is really tough. Life is really tough. I'm just telling you, no matter how bad it is here, we're still way better than other places outside of America. So we should appreciate America. Don't take anything for granted. And at the end of the day, if you're willing to work hard with the right mindset, there's nothing you can't do. If you don't like where you are now, you can change it. Awesome. Well, Long, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me.